morning. Good morning, everyone. I am your host, Jason Files. And this Happy New Year's Eve. First of all, I want to apologize for getting this out a little later than usual. It has been a... How can I put it? It has been an interesting turn of events. Uh... I'm back in Mexico. Be spending New Year's here. Be interesting. I wonder if it's going to be quieter than it is in Oakland. Oakland is like gunshot central. So far, it's been pretty quiet here for certain holidays. But I guess Thanksgiving really isn't the day to go shoot off guns, right? Let's see if what New Year's is like for me here in Mexico. And this is, we're coming up on the last round of all the pre-records, new show coming January 6th. We will be doing an update on Peru. The homie Camilo will be coming through. Derek Barnes should be coming through. And we're going to update you guys on what's going on with Peru. That'll be Thursday, January 6th. And then... January 8th, Ramsey Orta will be actually debuting his new book. Ramsey Orta is the gentleman that recorded George Floyd's murder by police. That'll be the Saturday show. And of course, after that, we will be introducing you to the sports programming that we're going to be doing on Sundays. And if you want to watch all this, the best way to watch it is following us on social media. Wherever you are listening to this show, there are links in the description to all of our social media. The best place probably is YouTube. YouTube.com backslash This is Revolution Podcast. Also, we're always live streaming on live streaming, live streaming on Twitch, twitch.tv backslash This Is Revolution Oakland. Even though I'm not in Oakland anymore, the show is born in Oakland. The show is born of these Bay Area roots. I'm also excited to get started. If all goes well, the homie Doug Lane will be flying in in a few weeks. We'll do our first episode of Terrace Talks, where I interview different leftist figures here on the Terrace. It'll be a, a beautiful, wonderful. A fair. This show uh, that you are listening to is from me, Gene Bajlan. When we were getting our pre-records together, he knew some fellow Kurdish academics and he wanted to do a show on Iraqi Kurdistan. <clears throat> and he did two shows, actually. And I forget why he did it, but he put both of them up. Um, maybe he was in the holiday spirit. Or maybe he didn't have access to Patreon. <laughs> I don't remember. But if you're listening to the show and you enjoy the conversation and you want to hear the second half of the conversation, the best way to do it, the only way to do it, if you want to hear it, the audio only, Become a patron. Patreon.com 
backslash Bitter Lake Presents. Wherever you're listening to the show, there's links in the description. Also, recorded some new music for the holidays, in case you didn't know. Even did a song with the homie who hasn't been on the show in a while. Uh, he's been busy doing his own projects. Napoleon the Legend, you may know him as... Uh, he's always on No Miki Khan's show. You may know him just from music. I think he dropped like four or five, maybe even six records in 2021. Jesus Christ. Guy, so prolific is such an understatement for, for the guy. Um, he also made the music for the Michael Brooks show. Was it was a guest on the Michael Brooks show as well. Honored to call him a friend. And he did me a huge solid. Wrote a verse for this track. New verse, not one of those like recycled. What's the BPM? Okay, this fits. <laughs> Wrote a new verse for for a track I made. I made the track. I was like, damn, this is good for him. Of course, there's links in the description to that it's EP, only available on Bandcamp, called Black Christmas. Released it on Christmas. Won't be releasing anything on New Year's. My holiday release schedule is is done. But I hope you enjoyed this conversation on the history of the Kurdish people, their fight for a Kurdish state. And again, if you want to hear the second half of this conversation, which goes for another, I believe, hour and a half, become a patron. Wherever you're listening to the show, there are links in the description. January 1st, another big show. We're doing our Haiti special. Pascal Robert and Dr. Paul McComb. Get ready. That music means I've talked too long. You guys be safe out there. Have fun out there. And I am. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jean Bajelon, and welcome to This is Revolution Podcast. I'm in today for Jason and Pascal, and we have a wonderful show lined up for you today. It's a deep dive into Iraqi Kurdistan and the recent set of protests that have rocked the region. And we have three wonderful guests and a very special co-host to discuss this issue. But before we begin, I would like to remind you all to like and subscribe. And if you are so inclined and have the means, please consider becoming a patron. It helps both Jason and Pascal buy their orange juice because neither of them drink. So without further ado, let me bring on my very special co-host for the day. He is 
the Paul Atreides of Rojava. He is, of course, Stefan Bertram Lee. Hey, Stefan, how are you doing? I'm good. The intro music is staying lit. It's great. Yeah, well, you know, that is just so that everybody knows that is all Jason's original music. You know, this is this is this is not uh, we're not taking music from anyone. This is this is revolution original hits. So, uh, you know, I think it's a little bit controversial, uh, you know, on the on the Apple podcast. Some people some people are very concerned about the loud nature of the music. But, you know, it is what it is. It's like, you know, sometimes sometimes revolutions are not so friendly. So before we bring quiet. before we bring on our guests, I have a little introduction video to get our viewers up to speed on the situation in Iraqi Kurdistan and you know what's been going on lately and yeah you know just just to set up the set up the set up the 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 situation so i'm going to play that little video now and then we're going to introduce our guests Thousands of Kurdish students took to the streets of numerous cities in northern Iraq, including Soleimania and Erbil, on Tuesday, demanding their monthly stipends be restored by the autonomous government of Iraqi Kurdistan. Due to falling oil prices and a costly campaign against the Islamic State terror group, the government stopped paying the stipends, worth about $50, in 2014. I'm okay, Wala. Wala. Look, all the young people are leaving this country. They are all gone. They have left the region because of these thieves. Protests have been going on in Soleimania for three days. They reportedly grew bigger and more violent on Tuesday. Local media report that several protesters were injured and security personnel deployed tear gas to disperse the crowds. Protesters also set fire to the city's ruling party's offices. Some shouted more radical slogans such as down with family rule, a reference to the Barzani and Talibani families' three-decade duopoly over the oil-rich region. We have students who have deferred their studies because they have no money. I know a few girls in the dorm who wash their friends' clothes to earn some money for that day. Even though the regional parliament had a special session on Tuesday to debate the problem, the protests showed no sign of subsiding. In an attempt to calm the crowds, authorities at Soleimania University scheduled a two-day recess. But on Tuesday, at least one university dean joined the protesters to show support for their demands. We support the students' demands. We consider them legitimate and within their rights. Students in Soleimania barricaded major roadways, promising to keep protesting until their demands are met. For Dilshad Anwar in Soleimania, Iraq, Bejan Hamdard, VOA News. Okay, so without further ado, let me bring on our guest. So our first guest of the day is is Dastan Jasmin. Uh, Jasmin, a doctoral fellow at the German Institute for Global and Area Studies in Hamburg and uh, a doctoral candidate at Friedrich Alexander University, uh, Langen, Nuremberg. She researches on Kurdish political uh, culture in Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Turkey. She's a conflict researcher at the Heidelberg Institute for International Conflict Research, focusing on the Kurdish conflict in Syria and the war against ISIS in, since 2017. So welcome, Dastan. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, we're really glad that you were able to make it this morning. I really appreciate it. So our next guest is Lana Askey. 
Uh, she has a PhD in social anthropology with visual media from the University of Manchester. Her PhD researchers uh, focused on how people in Iraqi Kurdistan imagine and plan their futures at a, in times of crisis, for which she produced the film Bridge to Kobani in 2016 and Future Factory in 2018. She currently works for the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs and is a teaching fellow at the University of Amsterdam. Welcome, Lana. Thank you, Jean. Great and, to see you. Well, it's great to have you here as well. It's great to see you. Lana is a, a, an old friend of mine going back to, uh, I think, 2014 when we first met. So we, we you know, it's it's really great to see you, see you and, and, and really looking forward to seeing the movies you've been making. And the final guest for the day for this super panel on Kurdistan is Abdullah Hawes. Uh, he is a researcher with a private consultancy firm in London focusing on Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. And he has worked for the BBC World Service, The Daily Beast, as a journalist. He is also the co-founder of Yalla News Organization, which was founded in, in 2014, but he's in, he is not affiliated with that organization uh, anymore. Welcome, Abdullah. Thank you for having me. Well... Uh, let's just get right to it, you know, because uh, there have been protests in Iraqi Kurdistan. You know, students were at the vanguard of these protests, but, you know, there have been more general protests uh, by other elements of society uh, in the autonomous region uh, of Iraqi Kurdistan, which, which basically, for those who don't know, is basically a state within a state that has existed since the first Gulf War, and the creation of the no-fly zone. So, you know, although the region is technically part of Iraq and does not enjoy complete, you know, economic and political sovereignty, internally it is governed by Kurdish political parties and two political parties in particular, the Kurdistan Democratic Party and the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, who basically have controlled that region since uh, 1990. And what we've seen is a, a wave of protests. These aren't the first protests to have taken place, but a wave of protests in the last couple of months, which have been accompanied, of course, by waves of refugees. People may uh, remember there was a refugee crisis in Belarus, uh, and many of those refugees were actually people coming from Iraqi Kurdistan. So the, the conditions in Iraqi uh, Kurdistan uh, are very unstable. Uh, many people are you know, unhappy with the current administration. Um, and basically, uh, you know, things are not going the way that perhaps the regional authorities that govern the region would like them to go, especially, you know, as they, you know, seek to maintain their autonomy vis-a-vis -vis Baghdad and, you know, build, you know, cooperation with international powers, particularly the United States, uh, France and the United Kingdom. So the first question I have for the panel, uh, which I'd like to start with Dastan is, you know, what triggered these protests exactly? Well, I mean, um, for the first part, it was obviously what was quoted most was that it was about the stipend that the students had so far. So depending on where you're coming from and where you're studying, you would have a stipend that would, you know, if you would um, convert it into uh, euros would go from, um, sorry, something is going on. Was that my? It was Abdullah. Sorry. That oh, okay. Was okay sorry um but that's good that's why we're not live <laughs> so um the protest um started off with demands uh to get the stipend back so since 2013 most of the students didn't get their stipend normally there was around if you would count it into euros um 50 to um uh, i mean 30 to 60 euros really not really so much um, a little stipend that they would have in the month. Um, and yeah, they didn't get it since 2013 because of, you know, the excuses were the financial crisis that, you know, there was a financial crisis because of the low oil prices, because of the refugee crisis, all of that. But um, 
basically the issues are going much much deeper we shouldn't forget that last year this time we also had a huge protest wave in the kurdistan region um and that these protests were actually met with fierce violence at least eight people have been killed the youngest was a 13 year old um, young man who was killed. So, and these protests were also sparking because of the general crisis that the Kurdistan region is having. So, while we see that first it started very issue based, which is very typical in the Kurdistan region, you know, we had teacher strikes, we have strikes of different sectors in the public sector, um, you know, we have um, youth uh, strikes, we have, um, you know, women's movements, we always have very issue based points, but then it just, develops to a very systematic issue. And I remember very well last year, um, I did an interview with Shirin Kawa Garmiani, who is the MP for the Goran party, and uh, who is the widow of Kawa Garmiani, who was a journalist who was killed for his work. Um, and she said um, she was also joining the protests. You know, she was injured last year. And the thing that she told me last year and that I think is counting right now as well is that she said, this is very different from everything that we had 10 years ago. People are not demanding reform. They are demanding revolution. So that's really the direction where things are going. Abdullah, what are your take? What, what's your take on, on this? Um, yeah, I mean, Dastan uh, pretty much summarized the situation. But uh, in my opinion, uh, the situation is a bit more complicated. First of all, uh, the recent protests have been rather small. I mean, um, and mostly focused on Suleimania in eastern Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, and the reason, I, in my opinion, is deeper. It's mostly psychological. Many people have been psychologically feeling defeated. Uh, this is why we have this wave of, uh, you know, leaving the region. It's basically, uh, in my opinion, the ultimate resentment with the situation. They are just hop; they have lost hope. Uh, in my opinion, this is the feeling of majority of people. I mean, these small uh, protests you see, for example, the students who protested for a few days, uh, demanding their stipend, but it was uh, only for a few days, and. Based on my observation, talking to people in these regions, the numbers were small, and it basically died down after a few days because there's not, you know, this uh, uh, this motivation anymore. Even even when it comes to such small issues, uh, in my opinion, the people are psychologically so tired, and it's partially because. There has been what I call uh, some golden years from 2005 to 2013. The situation at the time, I was living in Iraqi Kurdistan at the time myself. The situation was really very promising. Uh, economically, the region was doing really, really well. Everybody was having a good job. The salaries were far higher. Uh, it was easy to find a job. Politically, things were much different. Uh, it was the times that Goran was, you know, uh, becoming a movement and it was pushing the boundaries of freedoms, of demanding more accountability. Everything was kind of, uh, you know, was, people feel everything was promising, you know, there was a, a, a kind of a, a, a bright future ahead. But then suddenly, out of nowhere, in 2014, everything turned upside down. It was a massive uh, uh, trauma, I think, for most people. Because in one year, things became so bad that the KRG couldn't even pay the, the salaries of the civil servants, which is basically the bare minimum of you know, a functioning government. So after that not only things didn't go back to normal, which people were hoping, because these few years became kind of like a yardstick. Everything, people are measuring everything based on what was happening in these few, day, few years. Um, but obviously things are not going back to these, uh, these years, especially to, since Mansour Barzain came to power in, in uh, 2019. Uh, things have become worse especially politically, 
he's much more authoritarian than Nitirvan Barzani. He doesn't, you know, tolerate criticism, which is making things even worse. Um, a friend of mine was uh, comparing what was the situation, you know, around 2017 or 18 when Nitirvan was still in power compared to 2020 when he, he went back. He said, in terms of freedoms in Erbil, things are so bad, people are afraid even to, you know, make mild criticisms. Things are much worse. So in addition to that, now you have a, a, a skyrocketing of taxes, of bill services, in addition to people not being able to, you know, even finding a job. So in, for, for many people, the taxes are much more than they make, which is, I don't know how they, they manage to, to pay their bills, but it's becoming so bad. This is why everybody is, is trying to find a way to, to just leave. My own friends, I have some friends who were the type of people who were always criticizing people for leaving, you know? Even now, they are so hopeless that they think there's no future. They just want to leave. So in such a situation, uh, you may see some protests, but by, in my opinion, I wouldn't pin so much hope on them because I know psychologically people are tired. I don't think they will... They will um, I don't think we will see a serious big kind of revolution or protests that pave the way for revolution because of these situations, of course, also because of the way things are in Kurdistan in terms of geopolitics, the role of Turkey, Iran, uh, Baghdad. It's, it's really complicated. But uh, for me, this is the, 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 the bigger, uh, take that psychologically people feel very tired and and this uh you know this wave of refugees that we see is basically this well before i move to before i move to uh get lana's opinion especially because she's worked on you know what people's views of the future are like in iraqi Kurdistan. i just want to provide a little bit of context for our viewers who are not familiar with iraqi kurdish politics um both dastan and abdullah uh, recognize uh, um, reference the goran movement and for people who don't know, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the two dominant political parties in Iraqi Kurdistan are the Kurdistan Democratic Party and the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. But Goran uh, was a split from the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan led by one of their veteran leaders, which became a kind of opposition movement, uh, was, which was particularly powerful in Suleimania, which is the heartland of the uh, Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, but also was able to gain support in Erbil, uh, the regional cap, uh, capital as well. So that was a kind of important movement. And another important piece of context is that uh, the dominant political party in Iraqi Kurdistan, the Kurdistan Democratic Party, is dominated by the Barzani family. Uh, and uh, for much of the post-2003 era, uh, you know, region leadership, you know, effective leadership and governance within that part, uh, within the regional administration was led by Nechirvan Barzani, who was uh, the nephew of the leader of the uh, Kurdistan Democratic Party, Masoud Barzani. But, uh, you know, in the last couple of years, power has shifted away from Nechirvan to Masoud Barzani's uh, son, Masrur Barzani, who comes out of the intelligence services and, you know, uh, basically is much more of a security oriented uh, figure. So they're both from the same family, but you know, there is definitely a kind of difference in the way that the two have sought to uh, govern, probably shaped by their political uh, experiences. So I want to kind of move to Lana. What, you know, what, what's your take on this issue? Do you agree with the idea that, you know, uh, there's very little hope about the future in Iraqi Kurdistan as compared to how things were before 2014, which we should note was when the oil crisis hit and uh, the, the money that was flowing into the region kind of dried up. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think um, what I wanted to add to the, what has been said already is that um, firstly, what struck me about these recent uh, protests was that it was very much centered around Kurdish youth and students. 
whereas previously in a lot of the protest or demonstration, it was more gathered around civil servants or just the general public indeed. Um, and people were afraid after every few days of protest because they were obviously struck down by security forces. Um, and so you'd have like a kind of momentum of, of protest beaten down and then a moment of, of, you know, nothing. And then they come up slowly again. So I thought for me, what was interesting to see is how the youth and uh, students were actually Hello? going on the street and demanding uh, a Hi. ride. Hi. I think we're still trying to no, get stuff on in. Or... Oh, good. Okay. I'll continue. Um, and what also struck me about that is that you know who are these students actually because these are students from public universities and we have to distinguish the differences between the public universities in, in the Kurdistan region and the private universities that you know either um, ask for a lot of tuition fees and money or only um, people from wealthy families can go there or only people um, with certain types of connections can go there so we also have to make that distinction who is actually going on the street and who are these students and most of them uh, would be from public universities that either uh, don't come from uh, wealthy families or indeed um, travel to another city to actually gain uh, uh, education in another city and live in dormitories. And that little bit of money, you know, those few uh, like 30 or 60 euros would actually help them a lot because without that, they would not be able to survive. So I think we need to make that distinguish, uh, distinguishment first. Secondly, what I wanted to add is that what was really interesting to me as well is that back in 2015-16, I did my fieldwork in Slimani, actually. And one student from the University of Slimani told me that he was graduating. And at the time, he already said, because this is just the year after ISIS came, after the economic crisis started. And so all the kind of hopes and dreams people had for Kurdistan and even maybe becoming, you know, an independent country, they completely were um, struck him down. And he said, actually, after graduation, I only have three options. The first one is to leave for Europe, and the second and third one, depending on your ideology, would be either to join ISIS or the PKK. Now, I think for me, what was really interesting about this was not so much the fact that the student was going to do any of these things, but I think what uh, struck me about that was that um, all these options were actually a form of leaving. Mm -hmm. um, and by actually staying within the system that was being coming more repressive and had no uh, future whatsoever in terms of um, um, uh, in the job market in the same region, any kind of, of space for that, whether in the private or uh, public sector. Um, if you would stay, you would become complicit in the repressive regime that you live in. And I think that complicity is something people don't want to take part in anymore. And that's what we see continuing now with it's been already six, seven years. Uh, and nothing has changed. Actually, it's gone even worse, I think, in terms of freedom of speech, in terms of basic services. People are being squeezed so much, so they will try. But maybe like Abdullah, I'm also not super hopeful that it would lead to any changes. But I am very, um, maybe not happy is not a good word, but I am really um, astonished that youth have taken it upon themselves to organize themselves and go on the street and demand, even if it is a little bit of uh, money. Yeah. So we've given so far kind of quite Can a bit. I, um, jump in for one small addition uh, because uh, obviously we have two ruling families, but Kurdistan is somehow two regions as well. It's two systems. Uh, it's not only two different political parties who are ruling. It's basically two systems. Um, Erbil and Duhok are ruled by KDP, even in terms of uh, the police, security forces, the intelligence agencies, everything is really very different from Suleimania. So in a way, we have two different societies, although we talk about Kurds in Iraq, but it's really in many ways, because one of the reasons I'm saying that is most of the protests have been in Suleimania. They have hardly moved or started protests in Erbil or, or Dohok because the dynamics in this, in, in this region is really very different from Suleimania in, in, in many ways. So we have to consider this, this distinction because most of the protests and what we have been discussing is happening in Suleimania where things are quite different from Erbil and Doha. I think that's a, that's a very important point for our viewers to understand. Although formally 
in a legal sense, the Kurdistan region is an autonomous unified region. The reality below the surface, and this has existed since the 90s, is that uh, the Kurdistan Democratic Party controls the majority of the region and operates as a kind of one-party state where state and party are fused. And then in Suleimani, you have the same situation with the PUK uh, operating a kind of one-party state uh, in which power, uh, the state power and the party power are fused. And I think an important piece of context is that, uh, you know, we saw this in the last elections, actually. The KDP uh, still maintains a kind of solid base of support amongst, let's say, socially conservative right-wing nationalists. Uh, the PUK, which functionally, in policy terms and in structural terms, is not that different from the KDP, but at least theoretically comes out of a left-wing movement, has severely degenerated in terms of its uh, legitimacy uh, and its ability to control uh, uh, Suleimani. You know, the PUK uh, was a um, you know was a front organization made up of several different parties initially. The KDP is a far more centralized and powerful uh, organization centered around the core of the Barzani family, which has a tribal base. The Talabani family is not a tribal family. The Talabani leadership of the PUK does not come out of the, the leadership of the Talabani sheikhs. Jalal Talabani, who was the leader of the PUK, his power comes from his uh, role as an urban intellectual and a Soviet, uh, you know, somebody who, who came out of the urban wing of the Kurdish movement and not out of the more tribal wing. So there was a kind of difference in the nature of the family power. And in the, the PUK, there is a, there's a bigger degeneration of that power. And, you know, I have a number of theories. For example, the KDP treat their children like little kings. So from a young age, they were appointed to high-profile positions. I think Nechevan Barzani's son is now the head of the University of Kurdistan. He's like 23 or something like that. Whereas the PUK, Jalal Talabani's sons basically spent most of their youth smoking shisha on Edgware Road in London and then being parachuted in to high-profile positions where they did they hadn't built up this kind of strong base of support. So uh, you have a kind of uh, degeneration of the PUK, which... It's happening in the KDP zone, this degeneration, but at a much slower rate because that party has a stronger structure, has a greater legitimacy. Whereas in the PUK, you know, in Suleimani, when I was there in 2016, you know, even the children who are, you know, I was teaching at the American University of Iraq in Suleimani, even the children of the PUK leadership were saying, yeah, it's kind of a bullshit organization. Right? <laughs> even they were admitting that it was kind of uh, falling to pieces. I remember one Turkish businessman who told me, he said, look, I do business in Erbil because in Erbil, there's one person I bribe. In Suleimania, I bribe one person and then this other person wants a bribe and I have to bribe several, so I don't know who to bribe. So there's a, so the PUK is very much like sort of falling to pieces uh, a lot more. You know, the KDP still, you know, still maintain that base. The PUK and Suleimania is kind of the weak link of the duopoly that was mentioned at the outset. So... You know, I want to hand it over to Stefan because he had some questions to ask. I mean, we should also mention that we were talking about Garan earlier, but in the most recent Kurdish uh, regional election, Garan did terribly because people perceived them as not having distanced themselves enough from this duopoly. So we should be clear that there isn't kind of like an opposition waiting in the wings. And I think this this tells the point that Abdallah said about there not being really much hope of an opposition. But the question I wanted to ask was, we've already given quite a bit of kind of background on the KRG in general. Um, but to make something clear, uh, my impression at least, and obviously the guests can see if this is true or not, is that in terms of political economy, the KRG gets basically all of its money from oil. And this is why it's so vulnerable to these oil crises, because it's like 95% of its revenue is from oil. And so talk about the relationship there. And also, I've heard stuff in regards to kind of the KRG demanding a share of Iraq's general oil money demanding that the Iraqi central government pay its public salaries and so on. So if people could kind of untie what's exactly going on here, I think that'd be useful for the viewers. Do you want to go first, Esta? Yeah, I'm actually happy that the issue of economy is coming up because this is very fundamental. I have the feeling that, you know, um, even though in many cases we can see specific patterns, we can talk about tribalism, 
and urban elites, but at the end of the day, everything has a very materialistic point and everything has a very materialistic reason. And um, the first and foremost reason that would pop into my mind, if anyone would ask me, why is the KDP more centralized and stronger than the PUK, is that they simply have control over way more oil fields than the PUK. They have much, much, much more money. Um, the fact that people would still vote for KDP is that the patronage system that they have is so far just simply more efficient than that of the PUK. They're not, they're not specifically more intelligent, more amazing, more organized than the other party. It's just that, you know, so far throughout all of the crashes, throughout all of the crisis, they managed to still uphold somehow the basic of the um, money that they can give to their supporters. Like literally the KDP supporters that I know from Germany, they would even get a ticket to fly to Kurdistan to vote in the elections, like Iraqi elections vote for them. And then they would come back, like no matter whether there's Corona or not. So, you know, you got to afford these kind of things. Um, the big, big issue is the Kurdistan region has no production. It doesn't really have real um, means of production in that sense that they could have a hold of. And this has very different, like various reasons. And it's also important to, you know, be very cautious in this kind of dis discussion, especially when it comes to the discussion with the oil revenues. It's actually a very complicated issue. It's not as easy to say that, you know, it's just that someone didn't pay their share that they have in a constitution and someone just, you know, declared a referendum. It's all about politics. It's not really about Kurdistan, let alone the uh, Article 140 areas. Uh, Jenny and me know that full well as Khanakini people that no one really cares about that. Well, Khanakin, yeah. It's, uh, for people, <laughs> so what, for, just for people who don't know, the Kurdistan region governs three provinces, Duhok, Erbil, and Suleimani. But there are also Kurdish majority regions attached to other provinces, including Kirkuk, which is the center of the oil fields, in, uh, including Khanaqin, which is uh, part of Diyala province, but is a Kurdish majority city, and obviously parts of Mosul uh, province as well. And Article 41, uh, which was included in the Iraqi constitution, was designed to, you know, these regions or sub-districts of these provinces were supposed to be given a choice over whether they wish to be governed by the Iraqi central government or by um, the regional authorities. And that was never implemented. Now, the, the big push is always about the province of Kirkuk, because Kirkuk is full of oil. Khanaqin, which is not full of oil, but full of Kurds, is obviously <laughs> less important to the dreams of uh, you know, which is you know, it's funny because obviously Khanakin is some of is where you get some of the hard, most hardcore Kurdish nationalists, but is also you know uh, not really a big focus of uh, political effort because there is not much economic benefit to gaining control of Khanakin. So yes, uh, I think that's an important important point. Kurdish, too. Kurdish nationalists and communists, very important. <laughs> but. Um, you know, to get to the production side of things. So um, the most important thing to understand is to understand this phase after the Iraq war and what kind of economy was installed in Iraq and in general. This is not only about Kurdistan region. Before we had an economy where, you know, most of the means of production that kind of were taking care of the oil sector, natural resources, and that kind of stuff were in the hands of the state. And the state was pretty much governing everything, whether it is where you study, whether it is where you're working, whether it is how much money you get, everything was governed by the state. The state would take care of everything um, and control everything. And what happened in 2003 was that basically with the American forces, everything was dissolved. All of the state companies were dissolved. And to all the tankies listening to this note, Saddam Iraq was not a communist, um, you know, uh, utopia. It was hell. People were killed. There was genocide. Let's just make this warning um, again because people are forgetting things really quickly. But pretty much everything was liberalized. Everything was opened up. All of these state-owned companies were opened up 
one day to the other, all of the officials that were taking care of these duties were fired because, and that's an interesting thing to look up for those that are interested. If you compare debazification to denazification in Germany, you will see that denazification in Germany actually only included some top percent of the Nazis in the state. But in Iraq, you have really 80% of everyone who has somehow worked in the state sector just being kicked out and kicked out of politics, kicked out of work and everything. So we have this huge vacuum. And who came in? As we all know, private companies and not only from the United States. A lot of private companies from um, uh, Europe, for example, the first oil firm that actually catched ground in the Kurdistan region was the, a new region um, company. Um, you know, we um, had uh, companies from Turkey specifically coming in, taking over a lot of stuff. And basically, this is what happened to the Kurdistan region. Before the Kurdistan region was able to develop their own economy, after the last 10 years before the Iraq war, they were under, you know, oil for food program. They had sanctions. There was a lot of poverty and all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, um, uh, all of that kind of stuff um, uh, was, was the situation before. And then instead of being able to, you know, bring up their own production, to produce something themselves, to, you know, create sectors. And there is a lot of stuff that can be produced in Kurdistan. I mean, the agricultural sector was, was absolutely huge. You know, the Kurdish areas in not only in Iraq, but in Syria and Turkey and Iran are traditionally the ones that are regarded as the ones that are, um, you know, the wheat chamber of the of the country, all of these things would have been possible. But the situation was just that these political parties were already there. Political parties were much more institutionalized before any state, whether it's Iraqi federal state or Kurdistan region were institutionalized. And they were the first partners to access when you would like to make a business deal. So each and every head of every party was the first person that a private company would talk to if you, they would like to make business in Iraq or the Kurdistan region. This is not only specific to the Kurdistan region. If you look up, you know, some of the most important um, uh, figures in Shia politics, for example, they were some of the most uh, successful businessmen as well. So this is the situation that we had. So after that, nothing happened in terms of economic production. Nothing happened in the terms of really employing people in a kind of productive sector. Everything was just about how much oil did we do we get? How many people can we employ in what David Graeber would have called bullshit jobs in the worst way? Uh, how many of them can we employ? How many of them can we pay? And how many of them equal what share in the Kurdistan parliament and the Iraqi parliament. And that is a huge, huge, huge problem. That is a huge problem that we have to see. And I want to follow up on that point that Lana has just uh, mentioned right now. That's very important to bring up because there's always a lot of arguments about, you know, that person was a Basi and that one is a Josh and that one is this and that one is that. Many people were forced to join the Ba'ath Party. There were a lot of things that you couldn't do without being part of the Ba'ath Party. Basically, you couldn't even, you know, go to graduate school b b without being part of the Ba'ath Party. So that's really um, an important point. But really, when you look at Kurdistan, most important point is there is no production. There is only oil. And that also corrupts a lot of politics. I think people also, you know, the analogy with the Ba'ath Party and the Nazi Party completely misses a very histor uh, important historical point. The Nazi party ruled Germany between 1933 and 1945, so just over a decade. The Ba'ath party ruled Iraq from 1968 all the way down to 2003, so it had much deeper roots in society. Lana mentioned uh, in the chat just now that uh, you know people were forced to join the Ba'ath party, and I think Joseph Sassoon, who is an Iraqi Jewish historian, has written a book on this to show how much more embedded in society the Ba'ath Party was than, for example, the Nazi Party. So this big purge that took place after the first Gulf War, uh, uh, sorry, after the uh, invasion of Iraq, basically liquidated the entire sort of professional managerial class of uh, uh, Iraq and, and opened it up to uh, political parties, not just in Iraqi Kurdistan but also across the region. The way I often conceptualize it is, you know, in Iraq, in actually, before even the Iraq war in the 90s, 
you had Infitat, the opening policy of economic liberalization taking place. And um, under, you know, under the, after the war and the sanctions, uh, the sanctions had a dual effect on Iraq. The first effect was to cripple Iraq's capacity to launch offensive wars overseas by stymieing its economy. But the flip side was uh, the sanctions basically empowered the state to create, uh, to function as a, um, a, a patronage state because no one could trade with the outside world unless it was through the state. So it both empowered Saddam Hussein domestically and weakened him externally. And what happened in Iraq, you can understand, this fundamental patronage political economy that emerged in Iraq was politically liberalized, you know, compared to the Ba'ath system. But the fundamental political economy of a patronage political system, uh, um, you know, remained in place. Dastan, you want to jump in uh, on, on a point there? Yeah, the, the, the thing is just with the comparison with the Nazis, what we also have to remember is... Um, there was the the Americans had a Marshall Plan for Germany. There was no Marshall Plan for <laughs> Iraq or Kurdistan region whatsoever. There was a huge program. There was a Marshall the, extraction. <laughs> yeah, the Ma Marshall, Marshall extraction. <laughs> exactly. Like there was absolutely no plan to invest um, fundamentally. And also, um, you know, at the end of the day, Germany was a huge economic producer so for them it was absolutely clear that it would be economic suicide in europe to just cut off germany to just cut off their you know um, political and um uh, you know institutional elite there was something at stake but as you said iraq was just you know butchered down to a point where they were like you know we might as well fight 80 percent of these people mm -hmm. no one cares you know we're sending in our contractors we're sending in our private companies they will take over everything we take that martial extraction and we call it a day well this so, i mean this um, is it this is important people don't realize this but 1968 in germany was a protest uh, in many ways against the fact that all the nazis were still in power right you know that's you know that's what 68 in germany was that's why you know, German guilt over the war was not born in 1945. It was born in 1968 with this revolution against the Nazi elite that had continued to exist in the post, uh, uh, post-war era. So I kind of want to pass it on to uh, Abdullah and Lana. So Lana, do you have any thoughts on this? And then Abdullah? Yeah, I just wanted to make a remark on what you said um, earlier uh, about uh, people romanticizing um, time under, under Saddam. Um, and often people say nowadays, you know, yeah, um, instead of one Saddam, now we have a thousand Saddams ruling in the whole country. So I think that's kind of a funny analogy to, to go back to. So instead of one ruler that's repressive, there's like a thousand people that you have to work through. Abdullah? Um, on the political economy, actually, for the sake of simplicity, I like to, I think we have three stages. We have from 1991 to 2003. 2003 to 2013, and then from then until now. Or maybe from nine, 2019, we have a different situation as well. So uh, in the 90s, Iraqi Kurdistan was under triple sanctions, not only, you know, you had the uh, international sanction on Iraq and then Iraqi sanction of Iraqi Kurdistan. So the situation was kind of miserable. But uh, I think a lot of people were busy with agriculture, which was a, a, an important uh, um, uh, economic uh, 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 factor at the time. Uh, but what happened after 2003 uh, was that with the pouring of money from Iraq and the agreement of uh, the, the budget agreement between KRG and Iraqi gov government to send 17% of the oil revenues, there was a massive, what you can call, welfare state in Iraqi Kurdistan, but a very messy, chaotic one. They have employed everyone that they could. I mean, their supporters, KDP and PUK. So what happened at the time, you had many people who were doing, who were having more than two, three, four salaries, uh, with some of them with fake IDs. You know, it was basically a time that everybody was, taking adv advantage of the situation. And the, I think the blame here obviously goes on uh, KDP, the, the ruling parties, KDP and PUK, because there was a competition 
about how many people they can obviously employ so that, you know, for the benefit of voting for them or patronage system, whatever you call it. So you had this situation at the time. Um, but from 2013, there was this decision by the Kurdish leadership to push for what they call economic independence by um, exporting Kurdistan oil uh, independent from Iraq, which led to Iraqi government cut uh, KRG's budget, which was a major uh, deal breaker at the time because Kurdistan uh, went into an economic recession. Uh, so since then, there were attempts to find ways to kind of survive the, the, the economic uh, crisis until the new KRG cabinet came to power in 2019. Uh, the new cabinet, um, what they are claiming is that they have this new vision of, um, let's say, economic development based on privatization, based on, uh, let's say, cutting welfare, which was a thing in the uh, 2000s. And then you had... So the economic independence, so KRG has its own oil, uh, but it never managed to export it independent from Baghdad. What happened is the Kurdish leadership decided to uh, find uh, a, a way through Turkey to export the oil, although, I mean, legally, it's not a legal thing, but they have found a way through Turkey with the agreement with the Turkish, uh, with the Erdogan government in Turkey to export oil. And a share of the oil goes to the uh, Erdogan, his family, Al Bayrak family, his son-in-law, and other people are involved with, with, with Erdogan. So they have found a way to export KRG's oil uh, um, uh, without Baghdad's blessing, which was a major uh, legal issue at the time. Uh, so, as I said, after that, this is supposed to have brought prosperity to Kurdistan. The idea was this economic independence will, will bring more money because we will export more money than the 17 person that Baghdad is you know, giving us. That was the idea at the time, but it never materialized, obviously. So what happened is from 2019, Masrur Barzani with some consultants, I think affiliated with IMF, other people have tried to, this new economic model of uh, basically what they are doing nowadays is they're privatizing most sectors. They have started with electricity. They are doing it with uh, all the other sectors, even some very, um, let's say, small stuff like um, police traffic. Now they're even privatizing this. So it's, it's, it's getting a bit crazy, in my opinion. It's getting out of control. Uh, but for me, the issue is not only the privatization. What they are doing, they are transferring the public wealth to private m companies that they control. So these mm -hmm. companies are not actual normal companies who get these contracts, you know, based on competition and based on, you know, building a more efficient system. It's basically, usually what happens is in every sector, for example, in electricity, they have given the uh, sector to two companies, one close PUK, to PUK in Sulaymaniyah, which we have discussed is controlled by uh, PUK, and then one in Erbil uh, controlled or, let's say, owned by, by um, KDP or Barzani family. So this is the issue. What's happening, I, in my opinion, the situation is getting even worse. So there's this um, political economic model based on not only authoritarianism, but also a more strict monopolization of the economy by the Barzani and Talabani family, especially Barzani family, where they are even trying to control small businesses. So before yeah, that, yeah. what we had was they were controlling the big businesses, but at least the small businesses, they were allowing people to kind of, you know, you know, do small businesses. But now they are even trying to monopolize these small businesses. So the, the space for people to make money is becoming increasingly small. There's not much opportunity to people, especially because what they are doing is they are not legally telling you you cannot do it. But they have increased taxes so much 
that people just cannot afford it anymore. And for their own companies, obviously, they have ways not to pay taxes. So the competition is very unfair. So what happens is you get out of, 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 of let's say, you get out competed by them. And so this way, you cannot claim that they have just pushed you out of the business. It's just your own thing that you have decided to give up on your business. So this way, the space of uh, the, the economic space, just similar to the political space, is shrinking for people to, to, uh, to make money or to have, to have a normal business. So I mean, this is I mean, the new a, situation. It's the authoritarian, it's the authoritarian neoliberal, neoliberal model. Jen, you're, you're talking um, about yeah, I, I think um, so. A friend of mine has a very interesting uh, theory for this. Uh, she was saying that because Kurdistan is the, at the very you know periphery of this new global neoliberal order, and because we were in an economic crisis, obviously we when we saw it help, they were very happy to help. So the idea is based on privatization, neoliberal privatization, but. In my opinion, in practice, this is not new, neoliberal uh, principles. W what's happening in Kurdistan is a very corrupt, very, let's say, very uh, localized form of, of uh, neoliberalism, which is not what, uh, what we know about <laughs> neoliberalism, at least in theory. So uh, there's an echo. Yeah, you're echoing. That's strange. strange. Can you hear me now? Am I echoing now? No, you're fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I would I would say that neoliberalism in general is always kind of this way. I just think we have a more extreme version of it in, in Iraq and Kurdistan. You know, privatization in the United Kingdom, for example, obviously ends up benefiting people with political connections. But I do take your point. I think. I think it's a very important point that because Kurdistan is peripheral, uh, it's become a kind of experiment ground for this radical form of neoliberalism, which basically the, 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 the ruling political elite is trying to like fuse itself as the regional bourgeoisie as well. You know, so it just appropriates the entire, you know, uh, sort of business sector for itself uh, to maintain control. And we're seeing, I mean, I don't. I want to get your uh, your guys' opinion on this. I don't know if you've been following, but there were some reports in the American press uh, about uh, the Barzani family engaging in business in um, in the United States, and there was a whole rigmarole about it. Um, you know, a lot of uh, I posted about this on Facebook, and some KDP people were upset with me saying this kind of stuff and you know the, the KRG replied that Barzani's aren't doing anything the researcher was having an affair with with an opposition activist you know like typical character slander uh but uh Lana do you have any thoughts on on, on this issue especially about corruption and about um, you know about these reports that are coming out about the Barzani I mean yeah I mean uh, not to get into much detail from what I take from it is that um they're trying to create a facade uh, to the outside world and doing that with a very bad uh, way of PR, I would say. And I would actually expect more of them, which is uh, kind of funny. Um, I mean, they can afford it. So, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure where this terrible PR is coming from and how they're still in this type of level of creating a facade for people. Because obviously we know corruption is happening on all kinds of level there. Um, they know, the people know, there's no sense of false consciousness in, in the Kurdistan region. I mean, everyone is aware of that. And uh, like I said earlier, um, you know, talking about it, they want to free themselves from their own complicity in it because you cannot live without that system if you want to exist there. No one can. Um, and I, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's extremely funny, uh, but also very, uh, it has a lot of consequences, of course, for the people involved. So I... I I think it's um, kind of a surrealistic uh, situation there, uh, where, you know, um, what's the what's the word in English? The Kaiser Sunder Kleda, the the emperor without his clothes. Yeah, the emperor with no, no clothes. I think I think that's a really good description because uh, they all, you know, there's this whole facade of. Uh, I mean, I I would say this goes back right back to, you know, the the beginnings of the KRG, where there's this facade of 
um, you know, a vibrant civil society, Kurdistan, the yeah, other Yeah, buildings, infrastructure, we're going to be the new Dubai. I mean, this is obviously not what real wealth Don't and, forget and about Heli Love. They have Heli Love, okay? They have Heli Love. Heli Love is a... big ass balls. Well, what's his name? My mom. Uh, my mom, who is uh, Linus, met my mom, who is like a, a Welsh lady. Um, she she has a good phrase for the Iraqi Kurdistan region. She says it's all for a coat and no knickers. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so you know, there's nothing under. You know, it's all for a coat and no knickers. A lot of it is facade. But I say, you know, back in 2004 when I first went there, you had all this civil society, but behind this civil society was like KDP money or PUK money for these uh, organizations like feminism in Iraqi Kurdistan is basically something to keep the, you know, the board, the bourgeois feminism, the bourgeois, you know, the, the, the middle class yeah. wives uh, of, of, uh, you know, political elites or pe politically connected families, yeah. uh, you know, give them a kind of job, you know, Iraqi Kurdish feminism is basically upper class uh, women who have their children raised by Nepalese, uh, uh, nannies arguing over. Okay, who I wouldn't gets... say that about every kind of like not... Iraqi Kurdish feminism. Like, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, me. The elite as feminism. Was... The elite feminism. I'm talking about the ones. Yeah, well, but I mean, who is the elite? I mean, I have been working with CGDS, and I would definitely say that's elite stuff. Working at AYS is elite stuff. I would mm -hmm. definitely say I'm privileged AF. Um, but, you know, we went out there to the most, um, you know, uh, to the outskirts of, I don't know where, you know, outskirts of Halabja, you know, Shadazur and whatnot, to, you know, um, have uh, panel discussions with people about, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, GBV, about, um, uh, you know, um, FGM, to talk about, you know, even queer rights. I mean, you know, I mean, we shouldn't just fall into this kind of identity political idea of, you know, everything has to come from the bottom. I think we should be very especially as activists and would be aware that you have to use these channels, you have to use the elites, but there is some good stuff that you can do on the oh, way. I mean, I would say, I would definitely, I would say, you know, there are people who do good, there are two people who do good work. Uh, I'm not criticizing everybody who does work. Perhaps I was unfair in that sense, but I have seen, uh, and maybe I'm wrong about this. I've seen some of the activism tends to be like highly performative people attempting to get trips to Europe to speak at conferences when they do nothing at home. Now, I know I actually know people, you know, people at the people at AUIS uh, who had their gender center were doing like like really trying to do some stuff and things like that. I'm not so much talking about that. I'm talking about the kind of top down party officials, the, yeah. the, the top down party officials who attempt to monopolize the voice of uh, uh, like the Heli Love uh, music yeah, industry. Yeah, definitely. Who try, who try the, to monopolize. The position where I'm coming from to, to, to make that clear, because I think that is something very toxic that is happening in the Kurdistan region right now, is there is a trend that whenever something happens to a woman, whenever there's gender-based violence, whenever there's even right now when there were protests, when uh, young women were attacked by the police, the first thing that people say is, uh, um, where are the women's organizations? Mm -hmm. As if, uh, you know, the whole of Ba'athism and dual party rule and corruption, everything is um, because of uh, some uh, of feminist organization. So I think we should just not fall into that trap at the end of the day. But, um, uh, you know, I mean, and, and, and you know, to, to just say something about that, because I just mentioned the protests again, and we talked before about, you know, um, that the protests were more frequent in Slemani. I wouldn't necessarily say that. Um, we had protests at Salah Hadin University in Hawlid, where people were specifically chanting that they are there in support of the um, protesters in Slimani, and that's actually revolutionary for Hawlir. Like, I was talking to students from there that were there on those protests on those days. They were literally, like, we were like fearing for our lives. Like, we were like, um, you know, we knew that the students' union in the WhatsApp chat was calling. Uh, upon us to go to the protest, but at the same time we were afraid because we were like, what if there is people that are from the party and they are, you know, gathering us up there to, you know, beat us up? And mm -hmm. that happened. A lot of people were beaten up. A lot of women have reported they were specifically attacked. They were specifically trying to quote unquote dishonor them, saying that they would take away their phones, they will share photos on their phones. 
all of these things happen and the, the young people were still resisting you know and i think it's not really fair to those people that were standing up to do that also we shouldn't forget the body non prisoners we actually have a huge civil society movement and protest movement in body um we have people that were actively protesting military bases there that were detained um mm -hmm. some of them we have never seen them again you know in the outskirts of slemani and sharazur and germian and rania um you know and qaladize in all of these cities we have had protests and even to mention last year's protests that's also very important last year's protests that were actually costing people's lives were mostly focused on the outskirts of Slimani. the outskirts where people can absolutely afford nothing so if you're mm -hmm. talking to someone in Slimani, i don't know in sahola can you ask them how are you and he says that he's bad then go to share uh, to say Sadiq go to rania go to kafri and ask people there because those are the ones that are completely out of everything and that's very important to mention of course there's a focus on slemani quantitatively uh, and everything you know i mean it's just a big city but we should also appreciate that this younger generation and especially in the last two years we see a mobilization that is going beyond the divide between badinan and suran we see a, um, a mobilization that is going even beyond general uh, general um, uh, generational divides you know we see that in the protests even when it starts with the young people we have seen that older people are coming and they're supporting them i have talked to young people um that were um you know attacked by the police that were attacked with tear gas that were were like um, injured and they told me hey like some of these old families that were like living in the old uh, city of Slimani you know for the people that know Slimani the old city most people that are living there are really like the old school Slimani people like literally old people were dragging us in helping us giving us water really you know closing the door securing us from the police and I think that's super important to man mention that although there is like a lot of hopelessness and everything a lot of barriers have been broken in the last days and we should do you know justice to them as well can i can i add to that i think it's really important that you're mentioning this what i think is um um problematic at the moment or has been in the past few years is that all of this social activism all of these kind of civil space that is you know people are trying to make a difference is not being um included within the um, governmental level of representation. So when the government the officials try to represent the country, they go for a different type of representation and all of these other people that are doing great work, they are not part of that because obviously most of the things they do is in the criticism of the government and they're not actually being listened to in many cases. Um, and I think this is an issue where when you have a, <laughs> I don't want to say real democracy because that sounds terrible, um, but when you have a working um, space between uh, the public sector, between the civil society, you have the dialogue. And I think a lot of this work is not being at all taken seriously by, by the government. Yeah, so um, we're at an hour. So I would kind of like to ask people to sum up uh, their ideas about their thoughts, uh, their thoughts on the, uh, on the future and their thoughts perhaps on, you know, where things are going, not only within the region, but in terms of the, the re, you know, the regional players, you know, what's Turkey, we haven't touched on, for example, the Turkish military intervention in the region, we haven't really touched on a lot of issues, including, for example, the fallout from the 2017 referendum, that's a, we could probably go on for three or four hours on this topic. But, you know, I would like to start with Abdullah uh, and, you know, ask him, you know, what are his thoughts on the general trajectory of the region and how things are going to go and, you know, and then move to the rest of the panel? Yeah, um, I think the situation in Iraqi Kurdistan, I mean, the situation is um, in terms of public opinions mood, obviously there is a huge uh let's say a huge resentment among the population i mean the majority of population who are not benefiting from this uh corrupt system but uh what makes or what complicates the situation is the status of iraqi kurdistan because it's not a state it's basically sandwiched between two regional powerhouses which have a huge stake in the region uh uh 
not least because they have their own Kurdish population. So obviously always they will intervene and they will have a say of how things will go in Iraqi Kurdistan. More so now because Turkey, for example, they have gradually increased their not only soft power, but even you know physical presence in the region in terms of uh, military bases. Um, in uh, the KDP areas, uh, they have some 30 visible military bases, in addition to many uh, intelligence offices in Erbil, in like that people know, like it's just so. It's difficult, in my opinion, to predict because of all these. But the situation in itself is is ripe. But it's uh, but. I don't think we have a readily available solution. We don't have a readily available uh, movement to take over. It's still, we're still in this uh, period where uh, more morbid symptoms of this, you know, decline of what's happening in Kurdistan is becoming more apparent. But a new movement hasn't, is not, hasn't born yet, in my opinion. But even if it does, how would the change occur? Because I don't think, uh, given the uh, you know entrenched ties of KDP and PUK with Iran and Turkey, I don't think they will let go. And in my personal opinion, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I don't think change in the normal means will happen in Iraqi Kurdistan because of this complication, because of Turkey and Iran, and mostly also because U.S. and the West is becoming less and less interested in the entire Middle East, not only uh, Kurds. So this will make the role of Turkey and Iran even bigger. Uh, they will have a bigger say in, in the region's uh, politics. So in my opinion, there would be no actual change without a, an international and regional consensus due to the makeup and the way the region exists. Lana? Um, yeah, I mean, I want to add something about how the, um, the past years, how what unfolded in Rojava, what unfolded with the YPG and the PKK taking a, a take your role up there and the fight against ISIS. I think this kind of also, I don't want to say inspired, but, you know, it created this kind of political engagement and momentum for a lot of uh, Kurds in the diaspora as well, for connection between the different Kurdish parts as well. And I think this did open up space for a kind of ideolo ideological shift or a different type of future that people would imagine for Kurdistan. So I think we're kind of at the end of that momentum already, especially since, you know, Turkey is stepping up their military presence everywhere. Um, um, but I don't want to let go of those ties yet. I think it will be really interesting to see how those ties, uh, when we're talking either about international diasporic ties or, like Dasan mentioned, uh, ties between the different pr provinces within Iraqi Kurdistan, what they will lead to. So, yes, uh, we'll need international presence to actually make a change, but from the grassroots onwards and the connection people have and the presence of the Internet, I think people are thinking about different ways and whether that's leaving the country or changing the country. I don't know how what that will happen, but yeah, it's definitely created new new possibilities. Dastan? Well, I think uh, the scientist in me would definitely be pessimistic. I think the end game is about who is going to be the regional power if the U.S. leaves, and that question is mostly between, you know, is it going to be uh, Turkey? Is it going to be Iran? Is it going to be the kind of Gulf? Um, Jordan, Egypt, access um, that has a lot to do with the end game also in Syria. Um, I mean, for Turkey, the thing is, I mean, we, we have uh, elections coming up and there is, uh, you know, some voices that say, you know, JHP could this time make it and, you know, get the majority and maybe things would get better. I have absolutely no reason to believe that, um, you know, uh, uh, anyone who is studying Turkish history knows that most of um, you know, military foundations, military stat strategics, and also anti-Kurdish racism are coming from the Kemalist Foundation. So I have absolutely no reason to believe that they're going to stop the um, 
Invasions, actually, the invasions are included, were prolonged for two years. So um, the, another JHP government is going to take that. The Raisi government is absolutely not going to hold back. Um, I mean, uh, a lot of the recent op operation, uh, operations of um, Turkey, for example, in Choman area, were supported by um, Iran. So that is absolutely happening. Um, the, a lot of it is uh, depending on what the situation in Baghdad is. So we see that there are negotiations still going on. We see that the Sadrists are discussing with other Shia parties. A lot is depending on how they're going to dissolve their issues because that is going to influence what kingmakers or non-kingmakers, the Kurdish parties, and especially KDP is going to be to Baghdad. So this is also connected to that. Um, so all in all, I don't think there is a good point, and especially internally, I have to repeat this, the most important point, I think, when it comes to domestic issues in Iraq is we have a bazillion militias. Like, it's not like it's only KDP and PUK. We have more than 400 Shia militias. We have ISIS sleeper cells. If there is no disarmament of these groups, we cannot even talk about the remotest form of institutionalization. Because depending on where you live in Iraq, you have to, you know, be part of some militia or support them or get some backing from them. That's it. But... The activist in me is still positive because, um, you know, I still see that we have a lot of connections in our day and age. You know, people, people like you and me, we can talk to protesters. We can translate what they have to say. We can, um, you know, uh, reach out to them. We can spread their voice. We can support them. They can support us. We can learn from each other. And the most important thing I think in Bashur is to open up to complexities, to be open that, you know, life is just complicated especially some of us uh, leftists have a problem with that, but we have to embrace that. And um, nevertheless, I think there is great potential because at the end of the day, we should remember that it was the Kurds and the internationalists who defeated ISIS in the last years. Well, um, I would like to thank, well, actually, before I thank everybody, Stefan, any last words you want to jump in on? No, I haven't really spoken today, but I'm also, I'm not filled with words. I'm happy. Yeah, it, this was a really wonderful panel. I really want to thank everybody for participating. And to our viewers, this is part one of uh, a two-parter. And we're going to have a second discussion, but this time about some of the broader geopolitical uh, uh, questions surrounding why the Kurds don't have a state. And I will say to our panel, this is actually a question that people ask me all the time. And I'm like, well, you know, it's a very complicated question. And I think it's an interesting one. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So we're going to we're going to take a little break and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about this important issue. So for this part one, as we say on This Is Revolution, we are out. <laughs>